So in one of my last videos, the levity ring, I discussed several ring shaped devices and techniques from the modern era that were said to have been able to overcome gravity and levitate. One of the devices is known as the dodo ring, a type of alternative therapy device that was allegedly said to heal and rebalance biological systems via a type of biological and electromagnetic induction. Its inventor, an Italian biophysicist by the name of Gianni Dotto, observed that magnetic fields induced by electric coils and permanent magnets had small but very beneficial health effects. The proposed principle was that certain magnetic fields had a direct effect on the DNA in the nucleus of a cell. When the body was immersed within the beneficial magnetic field of the dodo ring, polarization of the DNA was oriented properly and the resonance synchronized to that of a healthy cell. The dodo ring itself was described as a massive ring of copper that was 27 inches in diameter. It was configured as a thermocouple with its ends forming a gap that was bridged by a dissimilar metal. Heating and cooling of the junctions of the ring and the bridge generated a very low voltage, high current DC field. Now this was vitally important due to its close proximity to the human patient, since we can see in the model above that it is not insulated. If we liken the low voltage to low water pressure and high current to high water flow, we can imagine that a large amount of water flowing under low pressure would not hurt but will only serve to drench the operator in water. We can compare this to a high voltage high current which will be inherently dangerous in such close proximity to the human body just as a high water flow under high pressure would also be very dangerous. So the dodo rings low voltage and high current will generate a very strong and very safe magnetic field in, in close proximity to the human body. Now besides this therapeutic effects, the other astounding claim is that the dodo ring would levitate while in operation, likely due to the interaction between its magnetic field and the geomagnetic field. But is this probable? A coil bathed in an external magnetic field would essentially describe the principle of the DC motor. The magnetic field of a DC motor is uniform just as the geomagnetic field is from the Earth's surface. And as in a motor loop, instead of a net force, we might imagine that a coil of wire energized in the Earth's magnetic field might experience an equal but opposite force on each side of the loop or coil as shown, resulting in a torque around a real or imaginary axis of the loop or coil. However, in experiments with suspended high power solenoid coils, I have observed slight but definite vertical forces whose direct directions are polarity dependent. My model for visualizing the Earth's magnetic lines of force has always been of them having both a horizontal and vertical component. The compass is affected by the horizontal component of the, the field and is reflected in the operation of the compass which orients itself with this horizontal component which is strongest at the equator and decreases the closer the compass moves towards the poles. Oppositely, the dip needle responds to the vertical component of the magnetic field and orients itself to it. The vertical component is weakest at the equator and increases to a maximum at each of the poles. But again, you, the uniformity of the field over a large area seems to limit how much energy can be obtained from that field. How could we enhance this effect? One way to achieve a stronger field interaction is to energize the solenoid outside of the Earth's magnetic dipole. In this method, there will be a sharper field gradient and thus a stronger magnetic interaction as opposed to the weaker magnetic interaction due to the uniformity of the Earth's 
magnetic field from the surface. This can be seen in magneto torques, which are solenoids mounted on the bottoms of some satellites. These coils adjust the altitude and position of some satellites by pushing against the Earth's magnetic field. Another way is suggested by the article here, which suggests that a magnet or coil approaching the dimensions of the Earth might experience a larger field gradient with which to interact with. Now, of course, this would be impractical, but it does suggest that a larger coil might experience larger interactive magnetic forces. But unfortunately, to preserve the coil's field strength, we would have to proportionally increase the number of turns of the coil, which would greatly increase the coil's weight and cancel out any gains in field interaction, at least for a given power level. Alternately, we could increase the energy of the power supply instead, which would enable us to avoid increasing the coil's weight by adding turns. But this gets problematic when using wires as they tend to overheat or if superconductive could fall out of superconductivity at increasing current densities. So how could we increase the energy without increasing the weight? We might have to develop ways of generating super strong magnetic fields without coils. Speaking of weight, let's estimate the weight of a model dodo ring. Of the ring's dimensions, the only thing we know for sure is that the dodo ring was 27 inches in diameter. This yields a circumference of 84.8 inches or 7.07 .07 feet. From the reproduced model shown in the picture, I'd say that the width of the ring was about 9 inches to cover most of the torso. We don't know the thickness, but since the current that the dodo ring had to carry was so large, we might need a decent conductor thickness. For the sake of research time, let's choose a thickness of 0.5 inches. So a copper ring 84.8 inches long 9 inches wide and 0.5 inches thick will give us 381.6 cubic inches for the volume. So with a density of 0.324 pounds per square or per cubic inch, a piece of copper with these dimensions will weigh in at about 123.6 pounds. If we wanted to half the thickness, the weight would then be 61.8 pounds. The ring was not lightweight. It truly was a mass of copper. So in order to cancel out the weight of the dodo ring, the electromagnetic interaction between the ring's field and the geomagnetic field would have to match this weight. And to levitate, it would have to exceed the ring's weight. So now we need to calculate the electromagnetic interaction between the two fields. There are at least a couple ways that we might model this in order to simplify the problem. One way is to reimagine the ring as a loop immersed in a uniform field, just like a DC motor. This follows, as we saw earlier, that the coil might actually experience a torque instead of a net force. But a calculation will still get us in the right ballpark range as far as force and then we can make some additional deductions. So in the motor loop model, we'll make the loop a square with equal sides that add up to the same circumference of the dodo ring, which is 84.4 inches or 2.15 meters. Divided by four, each side comes out to be 0.5375 meters or 1.76 feet. The formula for torque on a motor loop within a magnetic field is tau equals n, which is the number of turns, i, which is the, the current, and a, which is the air area, b, which is the magnetic field strength, and we have the sine of the angle. 
the number of turns is one since the device is simply a ring. The current is 30,000 amps and the area is 0.5375 meters squared which comes out to be 0.289 square meters. The Earth's magnetic field strength is 5 times 10 to the negative 5th Tesla and we will use 90 degrees for the angle for maximum magnetic interaction. The result is a torque of about 0.32 foot-pounds over the entire loop. So each side is experiencing half of this torque at about 0.16 foot-pounds but of course in opposite directions. Now if we want to find out the net forces on each side then we must first find the distance from the axis of rotation to each terminal end. This will be 0.88 feet from the axis of rotation. We then divide the torque on that side by 0.88 feet to get 0.18 pounds. So each side of the loop experiences 0.18 pounds of force at a distance of 0.88 feet from the axis but in opposite directions. This results in a torque instead of a net force. But the result here shows that the ring's electromagnetic forces are unlikely to overcome even the moment of inertia of the ring, let alone its full weight. Another model to help us understand this problem might be what I call the straight conductor model. This model may actually be more accurate as it says here in the document that the magnetic field of the ring is much stronger near the ring's circumference at a strength of about 120 gauss than it is in the center at about 10 gauss. This re resembles more the magnetic field around a wire which also has a steep drop off rather than the field within a solenoid or a motor loop coil which is more uniform in strength. So the formula for the force exerted by the magnetic field on a straight conductor is as follows. So with a current of 30,000 amperes, a length of 2.15 meters, a geomagnetic field strength of 5 times 10 to the negative 5th tesla, and an angle of 90 degrees, we get a value of about 3.225 newtons or 0.725 pounds of force. So again we see that the force is nowhere near strong enough to counteract the, wing, the ring's weight, let alone levitate it. If we're looking at the thinner ring that was proposed earlier that weighs about 61.8 pounds, we can get a ratio of weight to magnetic force at about 85.2. So the current will have to be 85.2 times stronger at 2,557,241 amps. So needless to say, the dodo ring would not have been able to levitate on these parameters alone. But this is not necessarily the end of the story. The dodo ring is a large conductor and as such has both inductance and a capacitance. These properties can be altered and tuned to certain frequencies simply by altering its geometrical characteristics such as its length and thickness among other quantities. It is even said here that the device had certain frequency responses. And so what if the dodo ring was a type of power accumulator? A power accumulator as shown here is a type of free energy or energy harvesting device for ambient electromagnetic energy. This realization is particularly interesting since the Earth's geomagnetic field is a fluctuating DC magnetic field. We also know that the Earth as a large cavity has resonant frequencies called the Schumann resonances. The Earth can thus resonate both acoustically and electromagnetically. These resonance modes are constantly stimulated by sonic and electrical stimulations from the geomagnetic field as well as ambient human-made activity 
and celestial activity. The energy in these ambient vibrations would be enormous. It might then be possible for a device tuned to the same frequency and phase with these ambient vibrations to be able to receive and accumulate energy from these sources. This is the principle of the power accumulator. To further understand this principle, let's consider two tuning forks. If the tuning fork on the left is plucked, it will vibrate vigorously at its natural resonant frequency. The non-stimulated fork on the right, having the same natural frequency, will also begin to vibrate. Now there is always energy transfers between all objects, but these energy transfers are maximized when the objects are in sync. In other words, when they have the same natural frequencies and these frequencies vibrate in phase. In this particular scenario, there will be a flow of energy between the actively vibrating fork and the passive fork. The vibrational amplitude of the passive fork would increase from near zero to a maximum until the vibrational amplitudes between the two are equalized. So what if the dodo ring resonated in sync with the Earth's own fluctuating background tell your occurrence? Going back to the power accumulator circuit described in the patent here, we can see this concept fleshed out in some detail. Essentially, it involves an, an antenna radiating an oscillatory frequency that is the same as that of the Earth's telluric currents. And since the main source of these telluric currents is the fluctuating DC geomagnetic field, then the device is essentially in tune with the Earth's magnetic field as well. The antenna and circuit are arranged to be close to and parallel to the Earth's surface. Vibrating at the same frequency and in phase with the Earth's energetic fields results in ambient electrical power from the Earth and potentially even the universe to accumulate along the length of the radiating antenna. This extra energy is then to be received and utilized by a receiving tank circuit tuned to the exact same frequency. Now looking at the description of the ring more closely, we can see that it is designed as a pre-tuned 350 ohm television antenna tuned to VHF or very high frequency as well as UHF ultra high frequency resonance. These frequencies were utilized to simultaneously reinvigorate cells and to neutralize cancer cells. Looking once, once again at the, the dodo device as a ring thermocouple, we can see here that it is indeed in the shape of what is called a magnetic loop antenna. Now an antenna can be utilized to transmit or receive electromagnetic energy and the dodo ring appears to have done both but with its primary function being to radiate energy to the human body. The description here of a loop antenna even says that they typically conduct very large currents, which is exactly what the dodo ring does with up to 30,000 amps, but of course with a very low voltage as aforementioned. Emerging modern wireless technology, such as Wytricity, will also apparently be utilizing these types of loop antenna to radiate and receive usable electrical power over considerable distances via resonance. The circumference of most loop antenna are chosen to approximate one wavelength of the operating resonant frequency. So with a diameter of 27 inches or 0.6858 meters, the circumference of the dodo ring is again 2.15 meters and so, and so the operating frequency would be about 139 megahertz which is just between the low band VHF and the high band VHF however the dodo ring document says that the dodo operating frequency is is at 1.9 megahertz which is claimed to be the frequency needed to trigger DNA replication 
synchronizing the ring to this particular frequency of 1.9 megahertz likely will have involved considerable tuning over a range of frequencies by altering the rings of dimensions particularly the size of its circumference and as such the ring may have occasionally been activated at frequencies which would have enabled it to become a power accumulator the ring would have been subjected to a massive energy flow and accumulation of geomagnetic energy which would have increased its magnetic field far beyond what even its colossal 30,000 ampere current would have allowed potentially leading to geomagnetic levitation however this was ob obviously not the primary intent of the therapeutic device it may have been discovered by accident additionally a magnetic field this intense would likely have been a disruptive force to the normal biological processes of a patient rather than a rejuvenating force hence the ring was likely carefully and painstakingly retuned to frequencies more conducive to subtler field magnitudes values that were strong enough to maintain the, the orientation of the human body as it says here but not so strong as to jeopardize the orbital spinning and the hydrogen bonding of the DNA. But let's examine some other points. The duddle ring was obviously attached to a larger superstructure as shown in the picture here and would not be normally free to levitate. Yet it was said to levitate from the ground. This suggests that the duddle ring was not yet connected to the superstructure and was being tested apart from the rest of the device lending support to the aforementioned tuning of the device another point would be the relatively low magnetic strength of the geomagnetic field itself we calculated earlier the ballpark amount of energy that would be required for the device to have levitated within the earth's magnetic field and this energy was quite high while the Earth's field strength is low, it is extremely vast, extending well beyond the physical and atmospheric edges of the Earth itself. And because it is so vast, it contains an equally vast amount of energy. A simplified hypothetical example of this low amplitude but vast energy supply is illustrated here. On the left is a mass made up of 2,500 dots representing the particles of a mass all vibrating at the same frequency and each at a field strength magnitude of two units the mass on the right is made up of nine particles all vibrating at a field strength of five units now, since the energy is proportional to the field strength amplitude squared we can solve for the energy on the left each dot has an energy of 2 squared or 4 so the total energy is 2500 times 4 which is 10,000 energy units on the right each dot has an energy of 5 squared or 25 thus the total energy is 9 times 25 which is 225 energy units so although each dot in the mass on the right has over six times as much energy as each dot in the mass on the left the total energy of the mass on the left is nearly five times that of the mass on the right this simplified example helps to illustrate how the geomagnetic field at a magnitude of only 0.5 gauss still possesses an absolutely enormous amount of raw energy so we know that a receiver solenoid or loop can receive energy from a transmitter loop if the two resonate at the same frequency and are in phase. The trick is to determine whether or not the receiving loop can also be tuned to the Earth's energetic frequencies and as a result become a power accumulator, a type of receiver for that geomagnetic energy. Increasing its magnetic field enough for it to interact much more powerfully with the geomagnetic field than it otherwise would and hence levitate so we have reason that the earth's magnetic field has a vast energy supply 
and that resonant energy and accumulation might have been one of the keys to their dodo ring's alleged levitation, which most likely will have occurred during tuning and preliminary testing. But let's go back to the aforementioned uniformity of the Earth's magnetic field in a little bit more detail, as it still begs the question as to whether or not even this energy accumulation would have been adequate enough to levitate a multi-pound metallic ring, or if the ring would have only experienced a weak torque reaction rather than a net force. We can actually liken the geomagnetic field to that of a huge solenoid. The magnetic field within the solenoid is uniform in strength, but it's much stronger at the poles where the flux lines are denser. The same is true of the Earth's magnetic field. The flux lines, which are rather uniform over the surface, but are concentrated at the poles. To achieve levitation or weight reduction due to magnetic repulsion, we have to have a system which has excess energy from a non-uniform field. Let's take a look at the figures on the left. We see that light poles of two magnets create a non-uniform field between them with divergent flux lines. This arrangement is unstable due to the excess energy and the natural tendency of the magnets is to reorient themselves into the configuration on the right by repelling and flipping. If this reaction is successful, then a uniform magnetic field configuration will be formed which will be more stable due to the lower energy. This follows as systems in nature tend to seek lower energy levels. But we must note here that this doesn't necessarily mean the minimums or the smallest energy levels. Because Earnshaw's theorem states that there is no stable configuration for point charges. This includes uh, magnet dipoles even at the most minimum energy potentials. But going back to the solenoid, we can imagine a small current carrying ring inside of the center far from either of its poles as experiencing minimal magnetic force. The magnetic flux lines are not concentrated like they are at the poles and the ring will experience relatively little force similar to how a ring or solenoid would be on the Earth's surface. We also see how the configuration is again similar to the fill within a DC motor in which each side of the ring or loop would experience an equal but opposite force resulting in a torque as one arm would be pushed or pulled downward and the other one pushed or pulled upward. There are a few ways that we might change this system to get definite levitation. We could move the mini solenoid closer to the poles where the flux lines are denser, the field strength greater, and the polarity more definite. Or we could change one of the poles of the large solenoid to match the other, which would create a non-uniform field. But of course this would be impossible as electromagnets and magnets must both have both a north and a south pole and cannot have identical poles. The third option is to place ferromagnetic or paramagnetic materials within the field. These materials concentrate and guide flux lines essentially becoming small magnets themselves. Within a larger uniform field, these materials would create what are called magnetic anomalies within the local field strength. The field strength here it will be much greater than in the non-enhanced regions. This will create a condition of greater energy for power generation or levitation as magnetic energy is related to the square of the magnetic strength amplitude. We can take this condition and apply it to the Earth, which also has natural magnetic anomalies where the local field strength is greater or lower than the general background field strength. Large deposits of paramagnetic materials such as basalt or ferromagnetic materials such as iron ore within the Earth's surface form another number 
of magnetic anomalies around the Earth. As an offshoot, it may be possible to construct tracks of these materials as flux guides to direct and concentrate geomagnetic flux lines. For this to be practical, it would be vital to determine to what degree the geomagnetic field lines could be densified and guided. According to the document, Dr. Dodo was keenly aware of these worldwide ge geomagnetic anomalies. We might wonder if he conducted some of his testing on the ring near any of these anomalies, or if his lab was located in a region of higher field strength. It might also be possible that certain orders of magnetism might have a direct influence on gravity itself. According to the following document, it is known that some magnetic anomalies on Earth also coincide with local gravity increases in those same regions. This follows as we may recall from science classes that energy and mass are interchangeable and that energy can curve the fabric of space-time just as mass can. And that curving of space-time is what causes what we experience as gravity and weight. So as unlikely as it may seem, the connections are indeed there. Our task will be to figure out how much gravity could be altered by adding extra magnetic energy. Also, does the extra energy and oscillations in the field induced by strong celestial activity like solar flares or even human activity create even stronger alterations in the areas of gravitomagnetic anomalies? Also, if the Earth's magnetic field boosts gravity, then can either extracting energy or shielding certain areas have the opposite effect of lessening gravity in those shielded areas? Even if outright levitation was not achieved, significant reductions in gravity and perceived weight would be invaluable when it comes to moving heavy masses. This might make us wonder if the ancient megalith builders knew the answers to these questions. An alternative explanation proposes that the correlation between the magnetic and gravitational anomalies on Earth is actually not due to any direct relationship between magnetism and gravity, but rather an indirect relation between excess amounts of masses of molten metal within the Earth, which generates also excess magnetic fields as well as the gravitational anomalies simply due to the concentration of mass in those areas. And of course, you know, liquid metal would also serve to concentrate the geomagnetic field flux lines. I actually believe that both processes are at work here. As the document points out, that magnetic fields do indeed curve space. So a magnet, or let's say a solenoid with a powerful oscillating magnetic field will curve the fabric of time space not only due to the, the energy within that magnetic field but also because of its own mass. So it might be reasonable to suspect that the gravitational anomalies on Earth are likewise due both to the increased magnetic field at those localized points but also to the increased molten mass or even the concentration of cool masses of magnetic materials like basalt and iron ore at those same points. The amount of electromagnetic energy that would be required to noticeably curve the fabric of space and time is theorized to be quite high. And so it is possible that certain effects in relationships may simply normally go unnoticed. But what we do know is that the energy stored in the Earth's magnetic field is around 100 million billion joules. So it might stand to reason that the Earth's magnetic field certainly possesses ample energy to generate curvature of space and hence the gravitational anomalies. And as others have stated before, the key to access accessing it may not be raw energy or brute force, but rather frequency and resonance. But all in all, this has been an attempt to answer the question could the dodo ring have levitated? Though we cannot rule out the possibility of it being only a legend, 
I believe that it is within the realm of possibility. Based on my own experiments with geomagnetic forces acting on high-powered solenoids, as well as the revelation that the ring was essentially a magnetic loop antenna which formed a capacitance with the ground. But I don't think that levitation was part nor a byproduct of its normal function. For the ring to levitate, it could not yet have been a part of its eventual fixed housing structure as shown. We recall that it is said that the ring levitated from the ground. This most likely happened as it was being simultaneously energized and tuned in order to find the desired frequency bands. And in being close to and parallel to the ground, the device would have formed a capacitance with the ground surface, thus adding an extra dimension of tuning and frequency response. If the frequencies came in response or in sync with the Earth's natural rhythms, enough energy could theoretically have been transferred to it, greatly enhancing its already fairly strong magnetic field and allowing it to levitate by repelling the Earth's field. Its levitation would have been unstable and would have had to have been stabilized by external means. The ring may have also gotten fairly warm to the touch, although no mention of this is given anywhere. But one last possibility exists for levitation of the dodo ring, and that is simply conventional maglev. Dr. Dodo, as a biophysicist, might well have had a laboratory that was heavily outfitted with magnetic shielding due to the high electromagnetic energies that he was using. Ferrous as well as non-ferrous metals like copper and aluminum are often used to shield against strong electromagnetic fields and waves respectively. If heavy non-ferrous metals were a component in the flooring of the lab, then perhaps the dodo ring with its high energy fluctuating DC current simply induced a field of opposing direction within the flooring, thus repelling it, causing it to levitate due to Lenz's law. In this clip, a 300 turn coil of copper wire weighing about one pound with about 10 amps of current flowing through it hovers a few inches above heavy aluminum plates. The dodo ring as a ring had only one turn, but a current of 30,000 amps. Calculating the field strength for both devices yields a similar value, with the dodo ring coming in at 0 0.055 Tesla and my coil at 0 0.049 Tesla, a 1.12 ratio in favor of the dodo ring. But the dodo ring with the same field strength, but a much, much larger surface area, may have produced considerably more lifting force. But would even this have been enough to lift a ring estimated to weigh a few dozen pounds or more? If the ring still functions as a, as a power accumulator, I could see this as being possible. But instead of a stronger field to push against the geomagnetic field, it would instead be reacting against its mirror image in the non-ferrous metal flooring. While this alternative theory is indeed interesting, I personally prefer the geomagnetic levitation version. But alas, only time and further experimentation will tell. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for more upcoming videos.